You're listening to The Valley Current. I wonder if um, there's some relationship between music and lifespan and music and health span. <laughs> well, think? there was once a uh, belief that was ultimately torpedoed that the reason orchestra conductors, classical orchestra conductors worldwide are so old and live so long is because of the music that they uh, deal with. Wow, interesting. But that, that, was, that was torpedoed a long time ago. And then there was an argument, and, and the, the, the reason is probably the same. Why popes are very old? Well, the reason is clear. They're, they're selected when they are pretty old. Right. And so they now have a leg up on the general population. Right. You're looking great. Well, so are you. Thank with you. With that fake uh, <laughs> ridge, ridge behind your head. I once upon a time, I should tell you, I once upon a time had that view because we lived my now deceased former spouse, we lived in uh, San Francisco for a period and we had this big view of the Golden Gate Bridge and it was quite a place in um, uh, Presidio Heights, you know, yeah. near the Presidio. It's quite a beautiful place. I have to tell you, had we not sold that place, I think it would have been these days, it would have been worth probably 20 or $30 million. It's just amazing <laughs> how the real estate has gone up in that neck of the woods. There's like places in San Francisco that are unbelievably valuable, just hugely valuable. And that's one of them. Presidio Heights, uh, there's a few other places that are very much very rich enclaves yeah, there was this. What is the neighborhood that looks down on the on the ocean before the bridge? Oh, like Baker Beach, that looks no, down. The, the the residential community that is very well, the most expensive houses I think mm -hmm. in San Francisco. I forget the name of the neighborhood. Uh, there used to, believe it or not, you probably don't know this because I used to listen to it as a kid. It was a radio program called One Man's Family. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of it? No. It was, this of course was way before television. It was broadcast from one of those fabulous houses that looks out on the entrance to the bay before the bridge mm -hmm. on that huge uh, mountain side or hillside. Mm -hmm. And he broadcast from that house for many, many years. It was, it was a sort of lovey-dovey program where he was very kind and generous and with his family, so it wasn't anything serious other than to display the good life in that part of San Francisco. Right, and that's what he did. Yeah, from that from that house, yeah, for many years. So he had he had some sort of broadcasting equipment. Oh right. yes, yes, because he broke it. I haven't looked it up. It was called One Man's Family, I believe. How are you doing? Good. You know, it's an interesting time of year here because it's actually kind of cold. The weather gets down to like 40 degrees, which of course is cold. For, yeah, I remember those days. Surprising. It's 80 here. Yeah, it's surprising. It's like what happened to this mild weather in the mornings in particular? It feels like you're, of course, you know, the East Coast has been getting some some cold fronts and i guess there have been some snow i mean living in new york i can't imagine how people are living in new york these days but they do it in the snow and they get by and it works out but i'm kind of curious what you thought about what's going on with uh the next king who's gotten his second dose of covid 
I say the next king because the queen had her 70th anniversary jubilee. Well, she's over 100. No, she's not. I think she's 95. No, huh? I don't think so. No? She's I'm talking about Queen Elizabeth now in uh, in England. Yeah, look, look, look her up on, do a search for her. Yeah, I'll do a search. I think she's 95. I think she took the throne at 20-something, maybe even younger than that. But uh, she's having her jubilee. I guess they they close uh, for Queen Elizabeth's jubilee. They they close uh, everything. I guess uh, this weekend. It's called the Platinum Jubilee. I don't keep up with that. I think that who is the heir? Prince who? Prince Andrew. Her, her son. No, her son. Her son is still alive. So her son. And his new wife, or really not so new, but the wife well, of the she, The queen just named her a queen a consort. Yeah, so, it's, uh, you know. But it, who is the guy? Is it Prince Charles or Prince, Prince Andrew? Charles, Prince Charles. Prince well, Charles. He's, he's no, no uh, bargain package either. <laughs> his political views and other views are highly suspect. Right. So she took the throne in 1952, but I'm kind of curious because. She well, how old? She, she was in her 20s. She was in her 20s. I, I'm looking for her age. She gave birth to Charles in 1948. That makes him uh, over 74. And I think she was like 20 something at the time. The reports are that Prince Charles has a second dose of, of COVID. And I didn't think that was even possible. I thought that once you got it once, you were sort of immune, but I guess that's not true, right? Yeah, it's possible when you have a uh, 20 or 30% error rate in the testing procedures. You mean that it could be that he doesn't have it and it's mistaken that he does? I, I, as I sent you a long discourse, mm -hmm from the American Society of Microbiology, of which I'm a member, that reviewed the tests and came and did a very thorough job. And they reported that there about 20% error rate. Wow. That's of false positives and false negatives. She's 95 years old. She was born on uh, April 21st, 1926. Okay, so I was wrong, so she's 95. She's 95. She'll be 96 in April, so she's not that far away from her 96th birthday. Well, she'll be 96 in April, and I'll be 94 in May. Oh, so she's a little older than you. A year, yeah. I have to tell you, you look a lot better than her. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really true. Here's the picture. Here's the picture of her. Well, then maybe they ought to make me king. There you go. But I was just wondering, like, um, the son has been waiting for so long, and now he's got COVID for the second time. I was wondering, like, it would be really strange, right, if it turned out that he ended up dying before he could become king, even though he's been waiting for for such a long time, I guess, is one way to look at this. Well, you you ought to look up his politics and his beliefs, which would cause you to worry less than you are worried now about his pending health. Oh, is that right? Yeah, he's, he's not a character that I have much respect for. Well, the whole way in which England operates with, a, you know, sort of a kingdom and a king and a queen, it just seems strange to me. It's more of like a tourist event than it is anything else, right? Yeah, I, I agree. And they, the citizens of the UK pay a fortune annually right. to keep that in a, li in a lifestyle that nobody else has. Right. It's a strange... And what's culture. even more... Com what's even more ridiculous, is that they are all descendants of a German cousin. Right. <laughs> who, right. They, who, who they embraced after the First World War. Right. 
It it's seems unbelievable. Very, it the seems first very world strange. war was a was a war between cousins. Right. It seems it seems very strange. I agree with you. It's not worth discussing in my judgment. Right. No, I get it. I mean, it's uh, it's an interesting question, though. If he gets COVID for the second time, genuinely speaking, does that say if it's really true that you have to be accepting of the view that even with vaccinations, uh, even with whatever precautions he took, probably not enough, uh, you can end up getting a couple and maybe even three, four and five, almost like the annual flu virus that we've talked about before, but probably a more serious uh, way, right? It may not necessarily be that situation, although it's possible. It's right. more likely that his immune response is weak. Right. And that that would account for multiple exposures. And there are people, people vary all over the map in respect to their antibody and T cell responses. Most of us fall into one broad group, but there are outliers like possibly him. Mm hmm whose antibody responses are, are not like others. It reminds me of what's going on now with news today that Pfizer has been forced to cancel the FDA meeting next week that was to have approved the lower vaccine dose for kids under the age of five, I think it was. Why is that? Because the antibody response was much weaker. Mm -hmm. than that for older people. Well, that may be explained by at, at least one possibility. There are probably others. It's possible, and in fact, it's very well known, that infants and babies who are still suckling are receiving antibodies from their mothers, from the colostrum that appears in their breast milk. Right. So that that dose of antibody from mothers who have been vaccinated transferred to their children. Right. So that a vaccine shot may not, may not boost what <laughs> antibodies they have received from their mother. Right. Could be an opposite effect because the nature of those antibodies are different from antibodies produced later in life. So... There could that could be the explanation, but that could be determined experimentally. But I don't know that anybody has done it. But they may be forced to do it now. So it's sort of like um, maybe overregulation of what really should be something that we try to get out into distribution. Is that indirectly what you're saying? That there's sort of too much regulation here. It's something that I think is called the eclipse period. Mm -hmm. If you have antibodies circulating right. to antigen X and you receive a vaccine against antigen X, that vaccine will now introduce antigens into your body that you already have antibodies to the agent X. Right and tie it up and increase your exposure. See, in other words, you get the actual reverse of what you expect. Right. And that may not last very long. That condition may last for a few months. I don't know. But there's probably experimental data for, on that point, but I'm not aware of it. But it's an easy thing to determine. I think it's called the eclipse period, and that happens with all vaccines. Right. If you have polio antibodies and you get a polio vaccine with a live virus like the salt vaccine or the Sabin vaccine, which is an attenuate killed virus, that could tie up your existing polio antibodies immediately upon vaccination, leaving you exposed, depending on the quantitation that's involved. Quantity of antibodies and quantity of antigen. So it, it gets very complicated, and there's enough confusion in the minds of lay people already not to confuse them any further. 
right. problem is with this whole story of the of the vaccines and the so-called the so-called confusion in the minds of so many people and the opposing views. That's all because this kind of business has never appeared in public before. This all appears in the scientific literature with every other vaccine other than this one. And so it's hidden from the public. Not that that's purposefully done for some evil reason, but because people are generally not interested. For example, when the polio vaccines were being developed, the only thing people were interested in was, do we have a vaccine or don't we? Right. The public never heard about what was going on behind the scenes in respect to the tests that were done or that were not done or how effective they were until the final announcement was made. And I lived through all of that, so I can talk about it in some detail. But the difference today is that the public is now exposed to the technical details of vaccine production, administration, and so-called testing. And that's obviously a recipe for, for mass confusion because people don't understand how the science, how science works in general. Right. I mean, it's sort of like the press wants stories, right? So the stories, you might say, that are behind what typically is pretty dense scientific literature gets summarized and spun by the press because everyone wants a silver bullet. Everyone wants a, a pill, an aspirin, something you can take something that is easy to put in your mouth and say, okay, now I'm going to be fine. Somewhat like the legal profession today in respect to, let's say, the charges and multiple charges or uh, evidence or whatever uh, right. accumulation of information there has been, and there's been a hell of a lot of it, in respect to Trump. Oh, right. Well, people get an explanation every day about whether the the 24 boxes hidden at Mar-a-Lago will end up putting Trump in jail. Right. So you have legal opinions all over the map in respect to whether or not that's going to happen. Right. Or whether it even can happen. Right. So, so you can understand it from that perspective, why I would be confused about the, the, the broad legal spectrum of beliefs that it will send them to jail or there's no way it will send them to jail. Right, right. So, so, so that, that's a good analogy with virology today. None of the opinions are a, a part of a conspiracy. It's just how legal thought and theories emerge and get accepted or not. Right. And then it plays into the whole politics of what are really 50 different state views about sure. the right approach and what's the right approach, mask, no mask, vaccination, no vaccination. Um, children go back to school. Children don't go back to school. It's like we have almost 50 different views in 50 different states about what's the right approach and what's the approach that should be used. And I, so far, I don't know that there's been any real close comparison between the different states on which one is, is doing better than the other, or for that matter, 200 different countries and which ones are doing better than the other. You know, it's, yeah. a, it's a strange time because there's a lot of data and no information. It's just a lot of data out there that could be harvested, but very little valuable actual information that's coming out of it. But when you kind of look at this whole question of when people look at science and try to figure out what should they make of it, is it sort of like, don't make anything of it other than that it's a work in process. That is... Well all and, science is a work in progress. Right? It's always a work in process. And you're in the middle of really something that will probably be studied for the next 
what, 50 to 100 years or more? Yeah. yeah. Think, about where, think about where law was 100 years ago and you get a picture of how virology was 100 years ago. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.